All right, let's see here. All right, we're live. So welcome back to DAP University. So today I'm going to talk about, you know, a use case for Ethereum, a DAP that nobody is really talking about. Really big. All right, it's got, it's, we're at an intersection of uh, current events and how this could be, you know, a game changer if we can pull this off. We're going to take a look at uh, what's going on with the markets, with Ethereum, with Bitcoin, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got a lot of the cool updates on Ethereum right now. Talk about these high gas fees and solutions that are coming out for this, you know, just down the road that I'm going to kind of go on in depth in this video. Uh, it's about big players like Amazon, uh, you know, digging in more with Ethereum and PayPal and a lot more. All right. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step by step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right. So we got people running the chat here. We got uh, Manny, Junior, Brad, Loud, uh, Ion, Max, McMillan, uh, Catherine, awesome, Thomas, Rodrigo. So uh, let's jump into this. So I want to talk first about uh, you know this this DAP for Ethereum, this use case that nobody's really talking about. Uh, so I just saw this tweet come out. Let me pull it up on my screen here. So talking about digital books built with non-fungible tokens, all right? So basically, think about NFTs, the NFT craze that's been going on right now, where we have these digital collectibles that are being speculated on like wild, right? We've got crypto punks that have been taking off digital artworks, people are buying them, flipping them for, you know, more value. That's a non-fungible token. We can do lots of other stuff with non-fungible tokens, all right? It's not just about digital artworks. We can do them for, uh, you know, concert tickets. We could do it for um, insurance contracts. We can do it for lots of different things, right? And maybe the ERC-721 standard that we use for non-fungible tokens isn't, like, the appropriate standard for every application of a non-fungible token. But the whole idea is uh, digitizing things on chain that can represent unique... Uh, you know, items that can be tokenized that people can own on chain, right? That, that provide some benefit by being hosted on blockchain and used on blockchain rather than some other way. So here we're talking about digital books, all right? And this is uh, core to uh, sort of the cultural moment that's happening right now. You know, we're seeing some, uh, it built about censorship with uh, some of the uh, like kids' books that are happening lately for, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on the politics of all this, like whether this is good, bad, right, wrong, all that kind of stuff, what the trade-offs are. But the whole point is like people are realizing that uh, there's more and more uh, vulnerability to like cultural, you know, tides changing or, or whatever. And then basically some sort of central entity or central power group basically saying, hey, we're just going to turn off blank. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're seeing it, the Wall Street bets, we're seeing it with this. We saw it with some censorship stuff uh, happen around the last elections, all that kind of stuff. So this is something people are more and more starting to come up in the in the public conversation. And, and the censorship uh, resistant quality of blockchain technology is one of the things that uh, is so powerful about it that it has real application for in the long term that people are more and more waking up to the idea that, hey, maybe there's something to this. Maybe this is actually useful. Okay, it's always been useful, but it, part of it is you have to have that consumer side demand in order for the technology to really take off. And so um, this is one particular application that could be even more useful. Okay, so think about a digital book. What are the benefits? So of course, censorship resistance, we talked about. People wake up to that. But uh, there's more here, okay? So look at this, like, so crypto native payments. So th those would be censorship resistant payments as well, but also transparent royalties. Okay. So if you were to pay for a book, um, you know, the proceeds could go back to the author, even after the book is sold on the secondary market, which could be crazy. Okay. That's, that's something that's really not possible now. So an author writes a book, they sell it, um, you know, they're going to get royalties from the original initial publication, the initial sale, but after it goes to use bookstore and changes hands after that, they're not going to get any royalties, okay? Um, so that's that's a big benefit. 
Um, one is transparency in those royalties. So you have to trust your publishers actually reporting the number of sales to you accurately. And it may not be, it may not be out of dishonesty. Maybe they just don't track all the sales properly, but blockchain would automatically automate all that away. Automatically automate. You know what I'm saying? Basically it would automate all that away. Uh, so that you can trust the royalties. There's, there's no like, there's no human effort spent in accounting really at all. Um, lots of the cool stuff talking about, you know, uh, digitally signed special editions, no region locks, uh, no server side censorship, which we talked about. So I know this is fully machine readable, translatable, annotatable. So uh, you know, if you want to basically have a, a automatically generated audio version like you see on some of these other platforms, like basically Siri reading your book to you, that's a pretty cool one. Um, you know, translatable to new languages, annotatable. So there's lots of potential here. Okay. Uh, now, I think there are some barriers for sure to like making this happen like tomorrow. Okay. Uh, there are some technological limitations to making, I think, a publicly or uh, publicly making a viable uh, ebook type of scenario tomorrow. That's got great user experience, all that kind of stuff. We could probably see some good experiments with it. Uh, there are going to be limitations, you know, with, with how tokens are transferred and all that kind of stuff. Uh, with the file storage, with performance, all that kind of stuff, right? I'm, I'm a realist. I'm not saying that like, hey, this is the magic solution we can turn on tomorrow. But it is a use case that I don't see many people talking about. And uh, I think we're very focused on DeFi, which makes sense because, I mean, DeFi is like, <laughs> it's 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 awesome. Um, but, yeah, I, I can definitely see this gain traction over time. Assuming also that we have demand for books. I mean, we have demand for audiobooks. Um that's that's the other part of this is we really need demand for books to make this this work. But uh, it's a cool name here. So DPUB, decentralized EPUB. I like it. Digital Native Edition. All right. So let's uh, let's go ahead and check on what's happening with the prices today. I'm gonna talk about Ethereum. I am talking about Ethereum. That's what this is about. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, let's go ahead and check on uh, ETH and Bitcoin. Okay. So I'm pulling my charts here. It takes me a second. I uh, actually close my web browser. It takes me a second to pull up the trading view charts through uh, through Glassnode. Um, so I'll just pull up the coin gecko charge for now. Anyways, so yeah. Uh, you know, we were looking at this yesterday. Um, kind of looking at the uh I think I can do uh just do the trading view chart here. I think it gets kinda I'll try that. I'm not very good at the trading view chart on coin gecko, but we'll give it a try. Let's see if we can go to candles here. So, anyways, uh, you know, with ETH, um, if I can pull this up, I'm not sure why it's not working. I clicked the candles, anyways. Um, sorry, guys, Let's see here, whatever. This is not my normal environment, don't worry about it. So, we talked yesterday about how you know we saw this. Um, let's see here. We saw this kind of jump, right? So over the weekend, we we dropped, right? We we went to 2K, like I've been talking about. I thought we would. I thought once we got to 2K, we'd probably see some sort of correction. Um, that happened, all right? We kind of saw this little glimmer of hope here. Uh, and I was saying, be careful, right? It could be a fake out. We could, we could trend lower. Um, that also happened, okay? And we saw this that we were talking about yesterday where we saw kind of a big price jump. We weren't sure what's going to happen. You know, it kind of looks like we're, uh, you know, jumping up like this. Um, it looks positive. It, lo it looks looks positive to me. Um, like I said, I'm not a big trader, not a big TA guy. That being said, we don't know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Uh, we could range sideways for a while. We could trend lower. Uh, big picture, you know, I'm not taking money off the table right now. I don't see anything here that is not financial advice, but I personally, I'm just telling you what I'm personally doing. Look at what I'm invested in, tell you what I'm doing. Um, I'm personally not taking money off the table. I don't see any reason to think that there are, uh, you know, big picture things that have changed. We can look at some of the on chain stuff. That's what I'm really most interested in. Uh, like I said, I'm not a big chart guy. I like to kind of look to see what's happening with these different supplies. Uh, what are the wallets on chain doing? All that kind of stuff. So I'll pull it up here in a second. 
Uh, but with Bitcoin, um, yeah, you're seeing kind of the same thing, right? Like the big, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin and ETH are somewhat mirroring each other, right? They're they're very correlated right now. Uh, the big thing we have to watch about, as always, I've been talking about this, is stock market, right? So I think crypto and stock market still correlated. Stuff's been very volatile in the stock market lately. Um, if we see a stock market dump, that would be a situation where the big picture has changed for maybe not the entire, you know, bull run. Uh, but maybe, you know, we have to watch out for that kind of stuff. Um, crypto is not in a bubble. Uh, well, let's, let's say, careful. I say this crypto is not in an isolated reality that is disconnected from the stock market. People about crypto being uncorrelated for stock market. I, I mean, if the stock market dumps, like crypto is probably going down with it. So we gotta be really careful about that kind of stuff. That hasn't happened yet. Um, I'm not saying it necessarily will happen, but we gotta watch out for that kind of stuff. We're not there right now. So long story short is big picture. I don't see anything has changed. Let's look at Glassnode. So I want to look and see what happens uh, with all these on-chain metrics, okay? Because these are really important. Again, uh, if, if, if you're new to on-chain analysis, um, it's an alternative. It's a different way of looking at um, what's going on with the overall cryptocurrency markets by actually analyzing the blockchain itself. So basically, think about technical analysis where you're looking at charts and like trying to do like chart patterns and look at volume, all that kind of stuff. A lot of traders do that kind of thing. Um, I don't personally really do that. It's not my, my strength. I don't really try to make price predictions or, you know, anticipate like where it's going next. I want to look at the big picture and say like, hey, you know, are we at a, at a top? Are we at a bottom? Should we, should we be, you know, taking money off the table, putting more money in? <clears throat> Excuse me. Should we be exercising caution, all that kind of stuff, hedging risk or take more risk on? um for myself my own personal decisions and one one thing i like to use for that is on-chain analysis that's one of the cool things about blockchain technology is you can uh basically analyze the blockchain itself <clears throat> excuse me and derive certain insights so if you have access to all the accounts on the blockchain how much cryptocurrency they hold you can uh basically analyze what their activity is so for example you can see how many people who hold uh, Bitcoin, for example, are in profit. And when that number gets really, 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 really high, like almost everybody's in profit, um, it could be a sign based on other metrics as well that there could be a correction coming very soon. Because, I mean, think about it. It's just like if everybody's got profit. You know, somebody wants to sell. Um, that's typically how things go. So I'm going to pull up and look at my uh, metrics here. I know a lot of people understand this stuff already, but there's plenty of newcomers. And so I like to explain and not, you know, assume that everybody knows everything. So that'll, of course, be a review for a lot of people, but let's look at uh, Nuples, one of my favorite metrics to look at. It stands for net unrealized profit loss without getting into all the details of how the metric works. Um, the, the gist is you want to watch out for these blue territories, which indicate a period of market euphoria. So market euphoria is basically when, uh, you know, you see these different emotions down here, capitulation, hope, fear, optimism, anxiety, belief, denial, euphoria, greed. So euphoria greed is basically when everybody thinks it's up only forever that the, you know there's this brand new paradigm uh that we're you know we're never going to crash and we're only going to uh <laughs> we're only going to you know the sky and never going to crash. Basically when everybody thinks that nothing bad's going to happen that's when something bad usually happens. I mean if you ever see like a vertical wall on the cryptocurrency price charts that's usually not a good sign long term. Uh so I don't know if you guys have seen like the Wall Street cheat sheet. I'm sure lots of you have seen this. I like to pull it up because again, there's lots of beginners. They'll be watching these videos. But basically, like, uh, yeah, if you look at like the Wall Street cheat sheet. So this this you know, you'll see some of these emotions listed on here. So if you look at market cycles, this is kind of true. It's, it's a very general uh, diagram, but like, you know, you look at. Uh, the phases of a boom and bust cycle, you know, it starts with like, you know, disbelief, hope, optimism, belief, thrill, and euphoria. This is what I'm talking about. Like you start to see it kind of go up and then euphoria is when this, you have this big blow off, like just vertical wall. The price moves up the fastest it has because you know, the, the, the vertical wall uh, characteristic is what means fast. I mean, you know, X axis is, um, 
time and the y-axis is growth and so when it's more vertical it happens faster okay so that that that's when you're seeing like when you look at prices and like hey we doubled in a week or we doubled in a day or all that kind of stuff in an hour uh, that's what i mean right so that's what this metric helps you realize is when is that happening and so in these areas of blue like in the, at the end of 2017 the last major bitcoin top um we saw euphoria, right? And and the metric helps us spot that kind of stuff. Um, euphoria tends to happen whenever we have major corrections or prior to major corrections, okay? Tends to. It's not a perfect metric, but um, let's look at... We, so the cool thing about Nupal is the metric resets whenever we have these big corrections. So I know people are sweating in their boots or quaking in their boots, kind of sweating over this past weekend saying, hey, is the bull run over? Sometimes that's a good sign because that means... The market's becoming healthy again. Uh, bad stuff happens when nobody thinks they're going to lose, right? Good stuff kind of starts to happen when there's risk on the table. People think, oh, I don't know, right? Um, so we re we've started to reset Met Nupal. It does not, did not come back down to where we were here, but uh, it did, you know, give us some headroom and put us firmly south of this 0 0.75 line before this euf below this euphoria line. Because we kissed it before, now we're lower. So the good news is if we move up slower, this Nupal metric doesn't have to like rock it back up because there will be some people selling along the way, which will, you know, add some of that sell pressure and keep the metric from just rising straight up into that euphoria. Because a lot of it's about velocity, right? If people are selling as it's going up, there are a certain amount of people in the network that are not in profit. You know what I mean? So, so that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, I'm bullish is, is we haven't, uh, we're not we're not close not as close to you four as we were. We kissed it. We came back down. Um, there's lots of other indicators to lots of other reasons to think that people are jumping into the market. Okay, so let's look at um, another thing I want to talk about uh, is um, yeah, we've been talking about a lot about roll-ups on this channel, you know, like Ethereum gas fees. Uh, one of the reasons I talk about it so much is because it's one of those common questions that I get, and uh, it's one of the least understood things about Ethereum, okay? Uh, there are going to be some people watching this channel who are, like, tired of hearing me talk about roll-ups, layer two, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I want to keep talking about it because it's going to be huge whenever it happens, okay? I'm not saying, like, the day it comes out, we're going to see, like, massive change overnight, but I don't think it'll be much long after on the grand scheme of things. Go back to what I said earlier this year, which is, uh, you know, in 2020, 2021, I think we're going to see wide adoption of layer two scaling solutions. So why is that important uh, for the gas fees on top of Ethereum, for the scalability, the transaction speed of Ethereum? Um, you know, talk about this a lot. People say they can't use ETH because it's too expensive. The gas fees are too high. Um, so we're building layer two scaling solutions. Some of them are here now. Uh, we've got a lot, uh, we have a one particular that's coming out in March that I'm super excited about, which is optimism for optimistic rollups. Like I said, the time is long the channel. I've got another specific video, uh, update, like a very succinct update about this. I think coming out on Friday. So subscribe to the channel. Um, if you want to see that when it comes out, turn on notifications, it's going to be like, uh, um, a really like to the point, like boom, 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 edited video. That'll tell you everything you need to know about that. But I want to put some resources in your hands, uh, kind of give you a preview of that that you can look at if you want to study more in depth. So one of the reasons I'm so excited about optimism, uh, there's lots of reasons, uh, is because it's it basically lets developers, it, it it's one of the easiest migration processes out there where you don't have to learn new programming languages. Uh, you can take existing smart contracts and, fairly easily move them over to optimism because it runs on the optimistic virtual machine which is compatible with the evm all right and then uh, but one of the biggest reasons is that smart contracts can maintain composability with one another so what does that mean well you have all these DeFi projects that talk to one another okay uh let's talk about money legos that fit together well those have state they have data backed inside of them on the blockchain and that composability can the, the optimistic like op, uh, rollups will maintain that relationship. Okay, so that's huge because um, we need that in order for these apps to be able to talk to one another, and for Ethereum's real value to be preserved. Because that's what you want. 
You want a scaling solution that preserves the best things that Ethereum has going for it now, despite the fact that it's slow. Um, you want this rich ecosystem of apps that all talk to one another to be preserved or else it doesn't make any sense, right? So you're not, you're not building silos. You're not building a side chain where you have to like bridge off and go do only stuff on this side chain. Um, you can take all the amazing network effects of Ethereum 1.0 right now and just move it to a new layer. Now there will be challenges with this kind of stuff. Like it's not just a magic solution that fixes everything without some pain, okay? Uh, people who are on layer one have to uh, migrate over to layer two. So there's a cost associated with that. Um, you know, there's a delayed withdrawal time to get off of layer two, but there's there's some huge um, there's some huge ways to address these problems. If exchanges can support automatic onboarding on layer two and off of layer two, um, that will make the problem a lot better. Um, there's also some proposed solutions on how like we can speed up the uh, off ramp process or the or the 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 withdrawal process off of layer two. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of complicated. I don't, I'm not feel like I'm not going to do it justice explaining it off the cuff, but uh, there are are special solutions to that. Another reason that I'm just so bullish about roll ups um, is because uh, I mean. Let's see here. Uh, just, just from the, some of the demos that I've seen and some of the people talking about them, uh, I want to share some of those resources right now. Again, I'm going to cover a lot of this in, in, in depth and in a very succinct video coming out on Friday. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. I'll put links to these and those videos if you want to check out these articles. But uh, it's just the results. Like So the demo synthetics they did, it reduced gas costs by 143 times. All right, transaction time was 0 0.3 seconds. Uh, you know, Unipig, which is the Uniswap uh, sort of simulation, they did it on a test network, reduced the gas cost by 10 to 100 times. And, you know, here you can see uh, Hayden Adams. So this is this is the mastermind behind Uniswap saying, imagine not needing to make any changes to your Solidity smart contracts to have a dApp work natively on Ethereum layer two with security from Ethereum, massive scaling, no data availability issues, and synchronous interoperability with other dApps on L2. So, I mean, yeah, that's a huge endorsement for this. And if you want to know what this looks like, um, I put out a really good thread. Let me find it. If you want to read this about the step-by-step, -step, go to my Twitter. Um, I retweeted this thread. Okay, this is really good. Just talking about optimism and why it's such a big deal so i'm not gonna read through all on camera here but you can you can see some of this stuff broken down okay uh, the last thing i'll say about this is um if you want to know how some people ask me like will ethereum 2.0 fix the gas fees because don't forget we're in this multi-part migration um, we're in Ethereum 1.0 that has some bottlenecks, right? Um, it is, it's only, only about 15 transactions per second. Um, you know, the gas costs are high. Some people say, well, Ethereum 2.0 fix all that. Ethereum 2.0 will have an impact, but the long-term roadmap is to have a layer two scaling solution on top of Ethereum 1.0 that works and then maintain the scaling solutions as we move to Ethereum 2.0 to generate the maximum amount of uh, performance and scalability that we can. And uh, part of the long-term gas reduction is probably gonna come from layer two scaling solutions as we move into Ethereum 2.0 world, okay? So there's a really good uh, article you can read about this. Um, so you can look at, uh, it's the Ethereum Magicians Forum. So Vitalik Buter, the mastermind behind Ethereum, um, talking about what a roll-up centric Ethereum roadmap would look like. So talking about short term, you know, advancing ETH1 uh, with roll-ups now. So they've been talking about this for months, 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 months. Um, that's happening basically now. Um, basically adapting the infrastructure for roll-ups. But the long term is what he talks about is basically uh, uh you know possibilities of how to how to make this work with eth 2.0 so there there is a lot of thought going into how this is going to work with the eth 2.0 roadmap but to me it would not surprise me if we see a lot of the scaling paradigms happen in layer one right now get them working battle tested in production because that's really what eth1 is i mean eth1 essentially 
is a proof of concept, <laughs> right? It's, it's not the final version. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about that, that we're using like a proof of concept, but that was sort of the, the vision for Ethereum all along was to essentially create ETH1, uh, get it out there, prove the that it works, it does work, um, and then ship Ethereum 2.0, which is what's happening right now. So uh, I'll get some questions here in a minute. A couple last pieces of news I want to talk about. Um, So one of them is um, Amazon offering Ethereum and their managed blockchain service. So this is the ability to run an Ethereum node on Amazon AWS. Okay, so if you're a developer, you probably understand what AWS is. If you're not, uh, basically Amazon, like Amazon.com, uh, runs a bunch of web infrastructure. So if you want to create a, a web server without building one yourself and running it out of your house, well, you can sign up for AWS, click a few buttons, and you have a brand new web server that you can put a website on, you know, do all kinds of stuff. Um, if you want to host a backend for a mobile app, you want to host a database, all, all kinds of stuff, right? Right. They have lots of services. Um, but they've, they have had a managed blockchain service for a while, but now they have the ability to run your own Ethereum node in the cloud. So this, this is like, this is good and bad, right? It's, it's awesome that... Um, you know, Amazon sees the demand for this is a huge validator for the technology itself. Um, I'm sure they have lots, I mean, lots of people are running nodes on AWS and Google cloud platform. Long-term though, um, it would be nice to see more ETH nodes, like less decentralized. Um, so that they're, they're not all running on AWS and they're not all running on the, I will be very clear. They're not all running on AWS, but it would be nice to see less run on AWS over the long term. Um, so the last thing, pull up my screen here. Last little piece of news, and I'll jump into some questions here. It's PayPal jumping deeper into crypto. So we saw, you know, last year when PayPal uh, opened up. Uh, their platform to let customers purchase cryptocurrency and pay merchants with the that was huge um they're getting deeper into it buying curve crypto custody firm um so paypal reportedly buying curve and israeli crypto custody firm for 200 to 500 million the curves is ready from some coinbase ventures uh, and ggc as well as integrate with the compound protocol uh, and PayPal expressed an interest last year in purchasing BitGo, a custody firm. So it'd be interesting to see what's happening here. Um, you know, what their, uh, what their, you know, play here is. Uh, I don't have 100% clarity on this, where this is only going to move forward. But I think the bottom line here is PayPal looks like they're doubling down on their, on their crypto bet. So let's go ahead and jump into some questions. Somebody says less decentralized. I think you meant to say more decentralized. Yeah, you're probably right. I might have miss. I might have misspoke there. I, yeah, I, full clarity. Um, if I said I would like to see Ethereum less decentralized, I mean I would like to see Ethereum more decentralized. So somebody says they have a master class and they have trouble. So there's an email down below. If you have a customer support problem, like you got a problem with the code from the master class or something like that, or you can't access it, uh, check out that email down below. So somebody says PayPal buying curve. So it's not curve finance. So that is a uh, that is a misconception. Uh, it's not like curve DAO like, or like curve uh, finance, like the stable coin swap. Uh, it's a different company. So any thoughts on some of the use cases for crypto we haven't seen yet? Um, yeah, I do have thoughts on maybe like why we're not seeing them come to life. So honestly, like, I think the biggest blocker for a lot of crypto adoption are just use cases and incentives, to tell you the truth. It's not necessarily the scalability. It's not necessarily the user experience, because think about it. 
I was talking about this somebody the other day. Um, I mean, Ethereum is slow. It's expensive to use. Uh, a lot of Ethereum websites look kind of sketchy. <laughs> okay. You have to like go through all these hoops. You got to get on exchange. You got to buy cryptocurrency. You got to transfer it to a wallet. Um, sometimes like the websites are scams. <laughs> like, so why would anybody do that? Well, because there's a massive incentive to do it because you can make money, right? You can go to an exchange, you can flip cryptocurrencies, you can yield farm, uh, you know, you can potentially make life changing <laughs> gains, right? With, with DeFi, uh, that's a huge incentive. All right. To use immature technology that's kind of brittle. Well, not really brittle, but uh, immature technology that's kind of clunky, I put it that way. Uh, so we lack those major incentives, I feel like, for other use cases, all right? Uh, in cryptocurrency, you know, Bitcoin is not like an amazing payment alternative to, you know, PayPal, right? I mean, sure, there's censorship resistance, all this kind of stuff, but it's volatile in price. There's so many hoops to, hoops to jumping through. I mean, it depends on who you are, right? But for the mass majority of people, if there was a massive incentive to do it, they would have done it already. And it just hasn't happened. So um, that's what, I think that's what we lack for other major use cases. Like the book I was talking about earlier, I think it's cool. Um, you know, I think it could be a big thing, but until, you know, enough people are sick and tired or until enough people have a, uh, enough reason to do it. I would just, yeah, they have to have a really, really, really strong reason. And we could make a digital book right now that worked on top of Ethereum. It'd be expensive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but unless there's a really, really, really good reason to use it, it's probably not going to happen. So this is what about Tether? So yeah, Tether's good. For, I mean, I mean, I'll just I'll say stable coins, not necessarily just Tether. So that'd be a basket of different stable coins. I mean, stable coins are good for payments, um, especially for inter like institution payments, where you're talking about large amounts of money and really fast settlement, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for individuals, it's great uh, for like paying other people. I mean, for merchants and stuff. I mean, I think we still have a, a little bit of ways to go before it's like widely adopted. I right, answer one more question that I gotta jump off for today. So this question is getting repeated in the chat. So do I think the government will ban cryptocurrencies from cashing out in the future? I don't know. I said stable coins would be huge, especially in developing countries. Yeah, I think I could definitely see that. I could definitely see that. Especially where a country, uh, you know, does not have a stable national currency. I think that's a good, really good point for use cases that are very compelling. Um, yeah, I think about it a lot. Yeah, because a lot of stuff I'm talking about are like, you know, Americans. Like, why would a lot of Americans want to use a stable coin? They don't necessarily care. But for a developing company, country that does not have a stable national currency... It makes a lot of sense if you can afford the gas fees to send it around. And that's one of the reasons I'm so bullish on layer two. All right. So um, that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. If you like these videos, um, you know, you want to get your hands dirty. How can you get started today? You go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. If you like those, you want to take the next step or hey, Maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely. I can show you how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right. You have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. All right. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.